of uh, Medicare Locals. Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker. I rise today to uh, draw to the attention of the parliament the forthcoming meeting of the United Nations Human Rights Committee. A meeting will be held in March where a resolution by the United States of America will call for the support for a full independent inquiry into war crimes in Sri Lanka. And I believe it is time that Australia stepped up and supported that call. And in that context, uh, I seek leave, Mr Acting Deputy President, to table the Public Interest Advocacy Centre's uh, international report on the International Crimes Evidence Project entitled Island of Impunity, an investigation into international crimes in the final stages of the Sri Lankan Civil War. I seek leave to table that. Is leave, is leave granted? Leave granted. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. In talking about Sri Lanka, I want to point out this is a country that I love. I first visited it in 1982 and was taken by the friendliness of the people, the rich culture, uh, fabulous food, the wonderful environment. It is a great country. I revisited it again in 2012, after the end, of course, of the Civil War and I was horrified by what I saw. That country, Sri Lanka, is now an elected dictatorship. It is not a democracy as it would purport uh, to be. It is controlled by the Rajapaksa family, and the dictatorship is effective because of the 18th Amendment that was passed, which effectively gives that family control of the country into the future. It's worth noting that in total, 29 members of President Rajapaksa's extended family hold senior positions within the government, civil service, media and industry. President Rajapaksa and two of his brothers, the Defence Secretary uh, Gotabaya Rajapaksa and the Minister of Economic Development Basil Gotabaya, control at least 45 per cent of Sri Lanka's budget and manage five government ministries. The son of the president uh, is currently in the Navy, and another brother is the Speaker of Sri Lanka's parliament. Mr. Acting Deputy President, what I saw there is a country where there is no longer a capacity for free or fair elections. The military effectively controls the north and the east of the country, and while peace is apparent, it is also a facade because the conflict goes on. There is the alienation of intellectuals throughout the country. People disappear in white vans and they're tortured. Many are never seen again. And they are from all uh, areas of life and ethnicity. And the reason for that is that they speak out against the government, they disappear. There is no uh, allowing of new political parties. In terms of the judiciary, you have got the appalling situation that since the end of the war, the uh, Rajapaksa government has centralised power in the executive of the military, dismantled existing checks on presidential and military power, and culminated in the impeachment of the Chief Justice. The International Crisis Group has called this a fatal blow to the already slim opportunity to re-establish independent institutions and the rule of law. The International Crisis Group report further stated that the dismantling of the independent judiciary and other democratic checks on the executive and military will inev inevitably feed the growing ethnic tension resulting from the absence of power sharing and the denial of minority rights. But not only that, you now have got the Rajapaksa regime controlling effectively propaganda throughout the country. There is a repression of the Tamil minorities. There are billboards everywhere that advocate for the power of President Rajapaksa. It's evident that the media messages are controlled so that the rural poor in particular are kept in line with what the president wants. While I was there, I bought a painting called This Is Not A White Van. It's now hanging in my office in Parliament House. And I bought it to draw attention to these disappearances. The Australian Greens also 
stood up strongly and urged the former government uh, not to recognise the credentials of the current Sri Lankan High Commissioner to Australia, Thesara Samarasinghe. He was a commander in the Sri Lankan Navy during the last days of the war when extreme atrocities were reported. And the former government did accept his credentials, and I believe that a, he will be part of any investigation uh, or subject to investigation in terms of the atrocities that were carried out at the end of the war. He was the chief of staff of the Sri Lankan Navy in 2009 when the Navy carried out the shelling of Tamil women and children in designated uh, safe zones. In my view, this government ought to review the recognition of those credentials. But we also, as the Australian Greens, uh, rejected um, the idea of Australia attending the Chogham meeting in Sri Lanka. We called for a boycott because we did not believe Australia ought to be recognising that regime. It is really time that Australia took strong action. I want to now go particularly to this Public Interest Advocacy Centre's report, Island of Impunity, and the investigation into the international crimes in the final stages of the Sri Lankan Civil War. It was developed with the intention of providing key decision makers with independent and credible analysis of allegations of international law uh, committed in the, first, uh, in the final stages of the Sri Lankan Civil War, focusing primarily on the period September 2008 to May 2009. Now, that report has now received substantial international coverage and deserves to. And I have tabled it and I would seek the support of people to actually read it and come to understand how serious this is that we have in our region, a country in which there are people being tortured as we speak, where human rights abuses go on and where a blind eye is being turned by a number of people. And the suggestion is that one of the reasons why the United States and the Indian government in particular have not uh, taken on this as they might have is because China has now moved in effectively to support the Rajapaksa regime and it is because of the geopolitical context that this is being allowed to go on. I want to go through exactly the allegations. During the armed conflict between the Sri Lankan government and the liberation tigers of Tamil Elam, abuses of human rights and violations of international law were widespread. It's alleged that in the final years of the conflict, war crimes, crimes against humanity, were committed by both the government forces and the LTTE. In the aftermath of the conflict, there was hope that the Sri Lankan government would investigate the serious allegations of war crimes and human rights abuses. But though the Lessons Learnt and Recon Reconciliation Commission was established by the Rajapaksa government as a result of international pressure, the promises of this action plan remain unfulfilled and no tangible action has been taken by the government in response to the allegations, hence the title, Island of Impunity. The Rajapaksa government has opposed an international inquiry into war crimes and abuses and has been backed by the main political opposition in Sri Lanka in this stance. The current situation has been described by Amnesty International as a persistent climate of fear and that the Sri Lankan conflict may have ended in 2009, but the high level of human rights violations in the country remains critically high. The Sri Lankan government shows no real will to account for past crimes combined with new attacks on those calling for accountability. The key findings of the report, uh, it, it compiles a range of evidence that illustrates an international investigation into war crimes and crimes against humanity is warranted. The available evidence suggests strongly that war crimes and crimes against humanity were committed. And though the evidence suggests that members of both the Sri Lankan security forces and the LTTE were responsible for serious violations of international law and international human rights law, Overwhelmingly, the evidence gathered suggests the vast majority of crimes were committed by the Sri Lankan security forces. These allegations include attacks in and around civilian areas, restriction of civilian movement, denial of humanitarian assistance, killing, conscripting and enlisting children, 
rape and sexual violence, torture and cruel treatment, enforced disappearances. The report also highlights ongoing post-conflict violations, including rape and sexual violence, torture and disappearances. As I have said, the United States, Canada and the United Kingdom have all led in their condemnation of the Sri Lankan government to investigate uh, war crimes. And in February this year, I'm pleased to say the United States has announced it would table a new human rights resolution against uh, Sri Lanka. Its Assistant Secretary of State, Nisha Biswal, has said there hasn't been sufficient action taken by the government to address the issues of justice and accountability. The culture of deterioration of human rights gives us great concern when churches and mosques are burnt down and people feel they cannot practice their faiths freely and without fear. I believe the urgency that has gripped the international community is justified. The British Prime Minister has also made some very strong statements, as has the Prime Minister of Canada. But where has Australia been in responding to these gross violations of human rights? Well, the answer is nowhere, and the answer is simply because of domestic politics, where the current Prime Minister is more interested in a domestic message on stopping asylum seeker boats than in dealing with the international disgrace that is the human rights abuses and the need for an independent investigation into war crimes in Sri Lanka. We've had a situation where, even though there is now proven to be corruption in the Sri Lankan Navy with regard to people smugglers actually giving advice to the Australians in terms of the management of, of, uh, of the uh, people smugglers, We've seen the Prime Minister give two patrol boats to the Sri Lankan Navy to intercept asylum seekers, and he has refused to criticise its human rights record, praising Sri Lanka for bringing more freedom and more prosperity. And that was uh, President Rajapaksa that he was praising. He went on to say that while his government, as in the Australian government, deplores the use of torture, we accept that sometimes in difficult circumstances, difficult things happen. That is the most disgraceful statement that an Australian Prime Minister could make because it is a clear signal that Australia will turn a blind eye to human rights abuses in Sri Lanka. It is unacceptable and I would hope that this parliament would reject it. Now, um, while the uh, United States has announced its intention to move a resolution to the, in the upcoming uh, meeting of the UNHRC, Australia must follow uh, the lead and co-sponsor. Uh, given that President Rajapaksa has largely ignored the two previous resolutions adopted by the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council calling for Sri Lanka to investigate war crimes by both the security forces and the separatist Tamil Tigers, the fact that five years on, since the conclusion of the war, we still have no serious attempt from the Sri Lankan government to address the crimes proves that Australia should not back away from this. We need leadership now, and it is essential that the world stands with those Sri Lankans who have demanded full accountability of what happened uh, during the war. And I would urge members and senators to read uh, the case studies. They are appalling. It is shocking attacks on civilians rapes and other forms of sexual violence used to intimidate and destroy populations. And in terms of post-conflict violations, there are several new witness testimony testimonies alleging that after the conflict concluded, the Sri Lankan security forces destroyed forensic evidence of international crimes, including that human remains from mass burial sites have been exhumed and covertly destroyed. And so, Mr Acting Deputy President, it is time for an independent and comprehensive international investigation into the allegations and breaches of international law. The Australian Greens put this to the parliament. We must support this. We must get behind the resolution coming up at the meeting uh, in March this year. But more particularly, Australia must stop appeasing President Rajapaksa and his regime. It is an effective dictatorship carrying out human rights abuses, a, a total restriction on democracy in that country, and we cannot turn a blind eye in this nation. 
I call on the Prime Minister to stop the appeasement and instead take a stand in the international community Time for human rights. Time has expired.